The man died, and when he got to the pearly gates, St. Peter said, before you meet with God, I should tell you, we've looked over your record, and to be honest, you really didn't do anything particularly good or bad. So we're not really sure what to do with you. Can you tell us anything that you did that would help us make a decision? The newly arrived soul thought for a second and replied, Yeah, once I was driving along and came upon a person who was being harassed by a group of thugs. So I pulled over, got out a bat, and went up to the leader of the gang. He was a big muscular guy with a ring pierced through his nose and tattoos in his arms and face. Well, I tore that ring out of his lip and told him he and his gang had better stop bothering this guy or they would have to deal with me. Wow, St. Peter said, that is impressive. When did this happen? Oh, about three minutes ago. <laughs> so last week, our first Sunday of 2020, we began to focus on a central theme for this year, that of intentional living. Consciously choosing the life that we want for the rest of our days. As true students, we recognize that we are always co-creating our lives with the indwelling God, who is our essential partner in this endeavor. Whatever is showing up in our lives, good, bad, or indifferent, is directly related to our thoughts and the emotions we have about them. Thoughts held in mind produce after their kind. The challenge, as we saw last week, is that the majority of our psychic activity is going on in our subconscious mind, what Charles Fillmore calls the vast silent realm that lies in back of our conscious mind. Since by definition we can't be aware of what's going on there, sometimes we can feel as if we are imprisoned by mental and emotional activity we can't see or feel. So the difficulties can persist in our lives, in what seems to be manifesting, even though we are working our denials and our affirmations to the best of our abilities. The founders of New Thought, and of course those who explored the rich and powerful relationship between the human and divine going all the way back to the dawn of time, focused on mastering the practical steps that we can take to, uh, as Emily Cady put it, to realize spirit. That is, to discover in our daily lives lived experience of the infinite truth of God within. Our predecessors, our forefathers and foremothers, had an appreciation of the geometry of the challenge, like we looked at last week. Without the advantages of modern science and psychology, these men and women recognized the grip that unseen forces seem to have on our consciousness. In the pre-modern mythic era of our development, we thought of these forces as demons and evil spirits who had their own independent existence. They belonged to the dark side and worked tirelessly to bring us over to their way of being. So as always, we can look to the Bible or something to illustrate the situation and what to do about it. So we all know one of the key events in the life of Jesus was the, what we call the temptation in the desert. This is, remember, right after his baptism by John the Baptist, he chose to go into the desert for 40 days of a cleansing meditation. And toward the end of those 40 days, guess who shows up? Satan. And Satan is there because he's going to lure Jesus over to the dark side. Now, this is a really important story because it shows up in the three synoptic Gospels, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So it's something we should pay attention to. So here's the version from Matthew. This is Matthew 4, verses 1 to 11. And then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After 40 days, after, I'm sorry, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, 
but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. The devil then took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. It's a very familiar story, and it's an important story, as I said. So let's look at this metaphysically. The metaphysical Bible dictionary calls Satan the liar in wait. Not liar, L-A-I-R, but liar, L-I-E-R. He who lies in wait. An adversary, an enemy, hater, accuser, opposer, contradictor. Satan represents, according to the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary, the deceiving phase of mind in man that has fixed ideas in opposition to truth, including making man believe that he is inherently evil. So immediately after his baptism, which represents, metaphysically represents Jesus coming into spiritual realization that he and the Father are indeed one, the subconscious opposition springs into reaction. This deceiving phase of his mind, this Satan, which lies in wait in the vast silent realm of his subconscious, emerges to try to destroy his new awareness of the truth of his divine substance. Now this is error consciousness, as Dr. Emily Cady says in Lessons in Truth. This is error consciousness that lives in our subconscious. The erroneous belief that we dwell, remember what she says, in bondage to the flesh and to the things of the flesh. This erroneous belief is tied to the way we humans develop because it's inescapably our first experience upon being born. We are born into a world of seeming conditionality. And so our minds have to develop in accord with this appearance. That's why in our Christian faith, we believe that baptism is an essential step that we all must take in order to overcome the temptations arising from this belief that we are embedded in the flesh, that is to say, embedded in the conditions of our lives. When we are baptized, we activate what Emmett Fox calls the golden key. In Charles Fillmore's book, The Revealing Word, he calls baptism the spiritual cleansing of the mind and says that this spiritual cleansing opens us to conscious submission to the creative law of divine affirmation. Baptism cleanses away the belief in bondage to the flesh and makes way for our adherence to the creative law of divine affirmation. So in this story, of Jesus and Satan, we can clearly see the dynamics of spiritual realization. When we undertake the spiritual cleansing that allows us to focus directly on the indwelling Christ, we are learning to resist the temptation to focus on the external conditions of life. Remember what Jesus says to the demon, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Here he is explicitly referring to the golden key, which Emmett Fox tells us is this. Stop thinking about the difficulty, whatever it is, and think about God instead. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Stop thinking about the difficulty, whatever it is, and think about God instead. And when we do this, when we turn our attention to God within and take our attention off the conditions without, we send the demons of our subconscious away out of our awareness. 
So the story of Jesus and Satan ends with this. The devil left him, and the angels came and attended him. So metaphysically, in place of these subconscious saboteurs, we get what the angels represent, thoughts and feelings of our divine essence. When we, f we feel the release of our fears, our grief, our anger, and we are flooded with joy, peace, and love. The inner peace that we read about in today's daily word. So, but notice how the story begins. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. So just as Emily Cady does in Lessons in Truth, the gospel writers start up front by affirming that accessing the truth begins with acknowledging our actual human condition and experience. Jesus was hungry. It's a corporal, physical feeling. And like Jesus, like the Buddha, like all those who have discovered the divine truth within, we are all born into a world of conditions, and now we are seeking to transcend those conditions into a world of unconditional love and peace. Well, we can't do this by denying our humanity. We can't do this by ignoring what shows up out of our subconscious, by trying to force things to be what they are not. We are not created the way we are only to cease being the way we are. Instead, we're invited to the difficult task of discovering the truth of who we are by becoming completely and unconditionally who we are. The difficult task of discovering the truth requires us to be who we are. Now, part of the challenge that we have is there's this basic emotional state that seems to get in the way, and we call this fear. Fear. Fear is a fundamental feeling induced by the perception that danger or a threat is about to happen. When we perceive the potential for such a danger or threat, we experience in our bodies a change of metab metabolic and organ functions and ultimately a change in behavior such as fleeing, hiding, or freezing from the trauma we think we are about to experience. Fear is basic to life because fear exists as a survival trait that helps keep us alive, helps keep us in a state of equilibrium by warning us that something awful is likely to hit us in the very next moment. In this way, fear is our friend and protector. Now, the problem is this. For humans, fear can show up just about everywhere. It's present in our physical, emotional, mental, and yes, even spiritual states. Fear warns us of potential danger not simply in our need to survive physically, important as that is, but it also shows up in our need to avoid emotional and psychological damage. Now here's the challenge. The way fear presences itself is through basic physiological processes, starting with the brain structure called the amygdala. Now the amygdala is one of two almond-shaped clusters of nuclei located deep within the temporal lobe. It's actually at the base of the neck. And this, is, this amygdala is in all complex vertebrate creatures. Research shows that these amygdalae perform a primary role in the processing of memory, decision-making, and emotional responses. These are all considered part of the limbic system or the mammalian or emotional brain. Just to give us a better sense of what we're dealing with when, we, when fear shows up, this is from the book The Feeling of What Happens by Antonio Damasio. And he's talking about how the, our body processes and feels what we call emotion. And this includes fear. In a typical emotion, then, certain regions of the brain, which are part of a largely preset neural system related to emotions, send commands to other regions of the brain and to most everywhere in the body proper. The commands are sent via two routes. One route is the bloodstream 
where commands are sent in the form of chemical molecules that act on receptors in the cells which constitute body tissues. The other route consists of neuron pathways and the commands along this route take the form of electrochemical signals which act on other neurons or on muscular fibers or on organs such as the adrenal gland which in turn can release chemicals of their own into the bloodstream. The result of this coordinated chemical and neuro, uh, sorry, these coordinated chemical and neural commands is a global change in the state of the organism, that is, our entire body. The organs which receive the commands change as a result of the command, and the muscles, whether the smooth muscles in a blood vessel or the striated muscles in the face, move as they are told to do. But the brain itself is changed just as remarkably. The release of substances such as monoamines and peptides from regions of nuclei in the brain stem and the basal forebrain alters the mode of processing of numerous other brain circuits, triggering certain specific behaviors <coughs> and modify, <coughs> excuse me, modifies the signaling of body states to the brain. In other words, both the brain and the body proper are largely and profoundly affected by the set of commands Although, although the origin of these commands is circumscribed to a relatively small brain area which responds to a particular content of the mental process. So now consider this, he writes, beyond emotion, specifically described as the collection of responses I just outlined, two additional steps take place before an emotion is even known. The first is feeling, the imaging of the changes we just discussed, the second is the application of core consciousness to the entire set of phenomena. So, I'm sharing this to impress upon us the fundamental fact that fear is biological first and foremost. As a biological fact, it's a powerful and non-removable dynamic of our human nature. It's here to stay. And so the question for us as true students becomes, whenever we're afraid, whenever fear threatens to overpower us, can we use this fear to return us to the consciousness of God? And if so, how do we do it? Now, I don't know about you, but my general experience in life is that fear can be pretty overwhelming, particularly in times of acute distress. As Dr. Damasio just showed us in the book, when I'm particularly frightened, a series of physical changes generate urgent and unpleasant feelings that while designed to get me to move out of some perceived danger, I would actually prefer not to feel at all. Even so, on balance, the fear experience is probably a good thing when that perceived danger is actually an immediate threat of harm or death, like when a car suddenly swerves in the lane in front of me on the highway. But what about situations when danger is entirely a product of my imagination? This Thursday, I'm getting on an airplane and I'm flying to Oaxaca, Mexico to spend time with my, one of my closest friends who's celebrating her 70th birthday. You would think that would be a fun thing to anticipate, so let me tell you about fear. I don't like traveling anymore. I used to love to travel. Now I just want to be there. So I have fears about traveling to Oaxaca. I've never been there. I don't know what to expect. I don't speak Spanish. How am I going to get around? How am I going to get from the airport to the hotel? How am I going to, make, how am I going to find pesos instead of dollars? What am I going to do? I have all of these fears that are arising in my mind when I think about going to Oaxaca, and yet none of these fears, none of these things that I fear is actually present. I'm actually standing here in Sacramento on a beautiful Sunday morning, and yet I can generate fear just by thinking about, imagining things that aren't present. I can start, as, as I just imagine this, I can feel my heart start to beat faster. I can feel my face flushing. I can feel my breathing starting to become more difficult. Fear of non-present imaginings. 
I think we can all do this, right? Want to try it? No, okay, therefore we're going to. What we resist persists, friends. So I invite us to take a moment now and think about something that scares us. Just bring to mind something that scares us. It could be something very trivial, like uh, showing up at the store and finding out I don't have my wallet or my purse, I don't have any money. Or it could be something very, very fundamental, fear of dying, fear of disease, fear of somebody leaving us. Let's take a moment and bring to mind something that you're scared of. I'm getting a kick out of watching the faces of the people saying, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so for those of you who did, notice how whatever fear it is that you conjure up, your bodies and your mind, your thoughts respond to the fear. All of those processes that are showing up originate in our subconscious. The brain reactions, the chemical secretions, the imaginal stories about what's wrong and what we're going to do, all these start below the level of our awareness. And we cannot suppress these dynamics, nor can we prevent our reactions. Even if we know ahead of time, like we just did, that we are simply imagining events that are not actually present. Now the story of Jesus and Satan in the desert tells us how to deal with our fears. Whenever we become afraid, regardless of the particulars generating that fear, we can sense the deceiver arising out of our subconscious minds. Our complex emotional mechanisms operate outside of our awareness until feelings shoot into our bodies and demand our attentions. So notice. Jesus did not ignore Satan. He didn't try to shut him up. Nor did he respond to Satan as Satan was trying to get him to. We don't have to suppress our fears, nor do we have to give in to them. Jesus knew something Satan did not, just as we true students know something that our automatic subconscious, physical, and emotional processes do not. Jesus tells the deceiver, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. That is to say, we are not condemned to be controlled by our human conditions and circumstances, but rather we can live, move, and have our being in the unconditional loving presence of the God that lives within us. So here bread represents external conditions. So when I experience fear, rather than focusing on fixing it, getting rid of it, fleeing from it, I could try to face it. And facing it, ask God to presence himself in it. Ask God to keep me safe from harm, to join me to his presence, and change the water of my fear into the wine of his delight. In my 12-step program, we have a saying that fear, F-E-A-R, stands for false evidence appearing real. Fear is false evidence appearing real. And that, that, beliefs, or that goes to the belief that God is greater than any condition that we can experience. So remember that at the end of the story, Jesus commands Satan to disappear, and he makes that happen by moving his attention to God and to God alone. Ultimately, even as we humans embody emotional states like fear over which we have no control, we can set the intention to focus everything we have, body, mind, and soul, on the loving God that always lives within us. We can overcome fear by applying the truth, the truth that God is all there is. So as we keep in mind this powerful story of Jesus addressing the collection of fears, resentments, envies, and hostility we call Satan, let's let Emmett Fox summarize how we can apply this lesson to our lives. This is from 
his beautiful essay, The Golden Key. And I believe we have copies of The Golden Key on sale. There's one left on the book table. Dr. Fox says this, we have said that the golden key is simple, and so it is. But of course, it is not always easy to turn the key. Now remember the golden key is, we take our mind off the conditions, and we put our mind on God. If you are very frightened or worried, at first it may be difficult to get your thoughts away from material things. But by constantly repeating a statement of absolute truth, such as, there is no power but God. I am the child of God, filled and surrounded by the perfect peace of God. God is love. God is guiding me now. Or perhaps best and simplest of all, God is with me. So by constantly repeating a statement of absolute truth, however mechanical or trite it may seem to our outward mind, you will soon find that the treatment has begun to take and that your mind is clearing. Do not struggle violently. Be quiet, but insistent. Each time you find your attention wandering, switch it back to God. So the story of Jesus in the desert, tempted by the deceiver, the liar in wait, Satan, is a story of how we too can face our subconscious fears and not get rid of them, not suppress them, not try to change them, but to surround them with the love of God by taking our focus off them, these fears and emotions, and putting our focus on God, on the God who loves us unconditionally, who will flood us with that inner peace, that peace that passes understanding, when we take the step to open our hearts and minds to this truth. So let's close with this set of affirmations. God is with me now. God is with me now. Together, God is with me now. The truth of God's love sets me free of my fears. The truth of God's love sets me free of my fears. Let's say that together again. The truth of God's love sets me free of my fears. So Divine Presence, we thank you for this story of Jesus who represents the Christ consciousness within us that no matter what demons lurk in our subconscious, they are part of us and that we transcend them by taking our mind off the condition and putting our mind on you and opening ourselves to the flood of joy and inner peace. Thank you, God. Amen.